Hi, this is Eric Martin with Board Game Geek. I'm here today looking at Blue Lagoon, designed by Reiner Knizia and Blue Orange Games for two to four players, ages eight and up, that plays in about 30 to 45 minutes. The summary of Blue Lagoon, if you just want to cut to the chase, it's Through the Archipelago. It's an alternate Earth version of Reiner Knizia's classic game, Through the Desert, a game in which two to five players place leaders of nomadic tribes on different pastel colored camels, on a hexagonal game board, and then turn by turn, expand those camel caravans through the desert in order to claim oases and claim watering holes and claim territory on the board. That's Kinesia's classic game. Blue Lagoon does something similar, but different. If you like one, you're probably gonna like the other. It's kind of interesting how it's the same, but it's not the same. It's the same in terms of the sort of playing decisions that you will make, and yet the scoring is different and that drives everything that you're going to do during the game. Let's take a look. Here's the game board for Blue Lagoon, set up for play regardless of player count, with resources and statuettes occupying the stone circles that are in place on the game board. We have four types of resources. We have pitchers of water, bamboo, precious gemstones, and coconuts. You have statuettes as well, and these are what players are going to try to claim during the game. Each player starts with a supply of five villages and 20 to 30 settler or sailor tokens, depending on the player count. Turn, very straightforward, you're going to take one of two possible actions. On the first turn of the game, you can only take one of those actions, which is to place a sailor on some water space on the board, anywhere you want to go. Next player has to do the same thing. Next player does the same thing. And from now on, you have a choice. You can place another sailor on any water space that you wish, or you can spread out from where you already have a token. You can place a settler on land and claim that statuette or a resource that's next to you. So you can do this, or you could place another sailor on the water and you will continue to place tokens like that over the course of the game until either all the resources have been claimed by the players, you put them in front of you when you take them, or someone has placed all of their tokens and all of their villages. Now, a village can be placed on any land space, just as you would a token. They have a special purpose, which we'll explain later in the game. You will continue to take turns in this way, perhaps cutting people off as you keep building, and you will do that constantly throughout the course of the game. Blue Lagoon continues in this way, very straightforward. On your turn, during the first exploration phase of the game, you either place a sailor token, or you place a settler token or a village. That's it. At this point in the game, the exploration phase is almost at an end as each player has only three tokens remaining in front of them. The other way the phase ends is when all the resources have been claimed, and if you block off a resource, or at least make it accessible almost only to you, you have some control over the timing of the ending of the, of the phase, because of course you determine whether this is going to be claimed or not. If the purple player wants to get this, it takes all three of their tokens, and of course the yellow player can snatch it away from them first. You're going to keep taking actions based on what you are trying to do. So say purple one does here, this is important for the scoring that will take place at the end of the phase. Blue wants to connect, have a chain of pieces across the board. Again, important for the scoring later. Let's say white wants to maximize certain things. Purple goes here. Blue advances out this way. Yellow claims bamboo. And that's it. The only thing left is one of these statuettes but the phase is over. Now we'll score the exploration phase for these conditions listed here, but not in this order because I find it easier to do it slightly differently. One goal in Blue Lagoon is to create a long contiguous chain of villages and tokens because one of the scoring conditions in a phase is for the number of islands touched by your longest contiguous chain. So for the blue player, they have one, two, three, four. I got cut off over here five, six, seven. 
and they have seven in their longest chain, so they'll have 35 points. It's five points for each island touched by your longest chain, so 35. Purple and yellow each scored only 10 points for the number of islands touched by their longest chain. They only had two islands in each chain that they built, but perhaps they had other things that they were focusing on. Let's look at some of the other conditions. Once you score for the longest continuous chain, you can remove all of the sailor pieces because they no longer have an effect on the remainder of the scoring. And it makes it a little easier to see which pieces are on which islands once you remove those. If you have a presence on seven islands at the end of a phase, you score a bonus of 10 points. If you're on eight islands, you score 20 points. We know that blue is on at least seven islands because of the chain that they had scored earlier. They actually are not on the eighth island. They scored 10 points. Yellow had dropped off everywhere. It's on seven islands as well. Purple didn't quite get there. For each of the eight islands, whoever has the largest presence on it will score six, eight, or 10 points based on which island it is. You can look at the Tokens here, three and three, so they will tie. And if you want, you can remove all but one token to show who is going to have the lead because in the second phase, the villages, as long as they're not built on a stone circle, will remain on the board. So for right now, we can mark the situation like this. For this island here, we see blue has the most, we can remove these tokens. Purple has the most, remove those, and so forth. Now you can more easily look at the board and see who has the majority on an island. Purple has eight, six, eight is 22 points. We'll write that down. We'll write down for blue and yellow. We split the points ev as evenly as possible when players are tied on an island. Once you've written the points down for majorities, you can remove the remainder of the settler tokens from the island in addition to any village that was built on a stone circle. Players should not be building there. They have no reason to. They will do it only accidentally, but the rule is there just to ensure that you don't do that. Scoring for the placement of tokens and villages on the eight islands is only half of what you are going to do in a scoring round. You also have to look at the resources and statuettes that you've collected. If you have at least one of each resource, which is not that hard to do in a two or three player game, at least in the first phase of the game, then you score 10 points as each player did here. And you write that down on your board, 10, 10, 10. For the number of statuettes you have, you score four points for each of those. Purple gets 16, yellow gets four, blue gets eight. And then you have sets. If you have two of something, you score a bonus of five points, as is the case here. Five for the blue, five for the green, and 10 for the three white. I have here 10, 10, 10. So purple scores a bonus of 30. Yellow scores 20. Blue, not much, five and five, 10 points. Now you sum all those numbers up and you see who's ahead. There are the standings at the end of the exploration phase with blue slightly ahead of purple, yellow kind of fell off, didn't concentrate on goods or links or majorities, so eh, kind of did this middling job and has some ground to catch up in phase two, the settler phase. Now, this is where we get into the through the desert part where you build out only from the villages that you have on the board. So you have an entire first phase of the game in which you are establishing villages, and now for the second phase of the game, you only have the second action available to you from the first phase. You can no longer place a sailor in the water unless it's adjacent to another piece that you have already placed. You are only gonna take the villages that you have on the board and you are going to build out from them, trying to cut people off, claim territories, because at the start of the phase, you first take all the, the statuettes, all the resources, you mix them up in the bag again, you pull them out and you place them on the 32 spaces across the islands. And that gives you things to fight over at the beginning of the second phase. The first player to act in the settler phase is the player to the left of whoever took the final turn in the exploration phase. That was the yellow player. So the purple player will act first. And now you will take actions again, but only building out from where you have your villages. 
So you can see where everyone is going to start. You don't have the freedom of the exploration phase of starting wherever you want with a sailor. You're only building out from these locations. I know I can't beat yellow to this precious resource. I can beat them to this coconut, but I'm only guaranteed to do so if I go first. Maybe I want to do that. I get a coconut. I know I can connect these two. I don't have to worry about someone coming in and poaching that area. But what's going to happen next? Who is fighting for what? What are they trying to do? If blue builds here, they're pretty much well, not quite guaranteed to connect, right? In theory, yellow could build here, blue could build here or here, and in either case, yellow can cut them off. What's more important for what these players want to do? You can't do everything. Unlike through the desert, once you get to take two actions, you're taking only one action on a turn. You've got one token, and everyone else has one token as well. So you have to plan ahead and figure out what you're going to do. If purple wants to try to connect these two locations, I'm going to have to thread the needle if I can. If I place here, blue can take this water. Yellow may or may not care based on whatever they're trying to do over here. Perhaps they want to connect this way. And possibly I can sneak my way through. Possibly blue will just cut me off. I can race across the board and never get over to touch this hut. What's more important? This is where things get tricky. In the second phase of the game, I played three times, twice with two players, one to three players. So I have not experienced the full four player game yet. It, it's very tense because you watch over the first half of the game and you try to imagine where are the best places to set up. But of course you have to already be building somewhere in that area in order to leave a village there. You can't leave a village, you know, except directly off of a boat. So you have to have a boat there and then plant that around and see where people are building from. You can get cut off very easily. If you, if you don't build a village in a certain part of a board, you're never going to get there, which means you're foregoing the huge bonus for being on seven or eight islands. You're not gonna compete for majorities there. You can't do everything though. So what's more important? What are you trying to get? And you can play off of what other people are doing only as you start seeing their actions put into play as well. The actions that you'll take in the settler phase depend not only on the placement of the villages where you know where players start from and where they'll expand from as they start placing their tokens, but also the placement of the resources and the statuettes, although they tend to be more of a bonus item rather than something you're really shooting for. You can score as many points with resources as you can with tokens and majorities. So you have to balance these two issues. If I'm the purple player, I can look at the board and say, I can definitely get these green and this green before anyone else. This one, no. This one, probably not. This one, maybe, because it depends on the blue player. I can place this here, and if the blue player doesn't do anything, then I can place this, and I know I can get the green before them. But of course, I'm seeding territory anywhere else. Uh, as long as I'm focused on this. So you're trying to focus everywhere. You're trying to respond to what every person is doing based on whatever plans you have in mind and you have to be flexible enough to change them. White, uh, purple has these three coconuts available. That's great. Probably not that one, definitely not that one. That one's again a long shot. But if I go here for first turn, Maybe I want to look like I'm connecting. Maybe I'm just trying to build up for the future. If yellow doesn't go here, I can take an action and then be assured of getting this. Unless, of course, blue has gone there on their first turn or yellow has done this on their first turn. All sorts of possibilities and you have to react to what everyone is doing all the time in order to make progress towards certain goals, trying to balance majorities on an island, making link chains, having a presence on all the islands, having all the types of resources, everything, 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 all based on these 20 to 30 tokens that you're going to place. The settler phase is going to end exactly like the exploration phase. Either all the resources have been claimed or all the tokens have been placed on the board. You then score the exact same way that you have in the first half of the game. Although the points are probably gonna be very different based on what people have done, based on their starting positions, based on what they've collected. It's the same yet 
totally not the same. And there's an overview of Blue Lagoon, which again, I've played three times now in a review copy from Blue Orange Games. It's kind of amazing because of course, Blue Orange in 2017 released Photosynthesis by Helmer Hawk, a fantastic, friendly looking game where you're building trees in a forest. It looks so delightful, so charming when you see it in play, and yet the game itself is fairly vicious and completely abstract. It's a luck-free game. Same with Blue Lagoon. It looks family-friendly. It looks like Kenitia does Moana. Hey, we're gonna go build, you know, on the islands. This looks fun and friendly. And of course, if they had a Moana license, Blue Orange Games probably could have sold many, many, many more copies hopefully paying for the licensing fee along the way. But it's a family friend friendly presentation. It looks like an easy, no challenge game. And yet the game is all about observing other players and responding to what they do, making smart choices based on what they do. It, it's, it's incredibly tight and hard as long as you're playing against people who know what they're doing. And so this is, the, the range of players. Who are you going to find? If one player has a lot of experience with this type of game, you play against a through the desert expert who can judge these situations. I know which spaces I can reach in my next turn. Are they thinking about that? What are they planning for? What are the, the areas that they can influence? You can imagine these little colored bubbles around places, holdings on the board. What can they reach next? What can they reach in two turns? What's available to me and how do these intersect? What's safe? What can I leave to later? And then what do I have to fight for right now? Possibly with multiple players, because of course you have all sorts of people competing for different things. I can't wait to play this with four just to try this out and see how much tighter it is. It just hasn't worked out with uh, people going on vacations, traveling all around. You know, people get on boats, they sail to islands, things get busy. So, there's an overview of Blue Lagoon. Look for this, Gen Con 2018, and after that.